Hello YouTube, welcome back. It's still freezing cold. We just had a snow shower outside. It's uh, mid-December and I just thought it's very stupid of me to have my hands on this frame because it's absolutely freezing. So, moving on. It's completely stripped. I'm waiting for uh, various bits to get the rest of the engine apart. So, momentum is everything in a project like this. So, no time to waste. So, I'm going to keep going. So today we're going to look at the frame, we're going to check it having stripped it for any signs of damage, kinking, and particularly on these oil and frame models, cracking down here because it's uh, these early ones were prone to issues in this area. It looks okay under the paint, but we should find out when we get it off. So the next thing is... We've got to get the paint off. Now, I don't live anywhere near anyone that does blasting and powder coating, and I'm not entirely sure that on balance is what I want anyway. I know lots of people love it, I'm just not one of them, personal preference. So, I'm going to strip the frame, etch it, prime it, paint it. I haven't decided on the colour still, which is uh, very indecisive of me, but hey ho, we shall see. And on the topic of paint stripper, if you go to your local DIY place, I won't mention any names, but you know what I mean, the large out of town DIY centres, you can get well known brands of paint stripper, all of which, in my opinion, are about a third of the strength they used to be. So, I always use this stuff, I get it from my local car paint supplier, uh, you'll often find stalls selling it at Ultra Jumbles, it is properly strong, it still burns your hands like in the old days, so you've got to wear gloves, you've got to wear eye protection, but it actually gets the paint off and it does it quickly. And when I did a Bonneville, a late Bonneville, with the same frame, it had been powder coated at the factory it's a 1979 model and everyone said oh paint stripper won't touch powder coat took it off it took a little bit longer than ordinary paint but it got it off so as long as you take care in its use using a well ventilated area and take appropriate measures to protect your eyes protect your hands protect other parts of your skin i really would recommend using this sort of paint stripper so i'll turn you off I'll apply some, particularly around here first of all, because you don't want to see the entire strip, the frame being stripped, that is really, really dull. So I'll just strip this section around here first, because this is where the likely damage, if any, is going to be, and we'll just see how quickly it works. Okay, let's do that. Right, I'm just going to slap it on. I could have wire brushed some of this off, but it's not that heavy. So, got a very old brush. I'm just going to put plenty on to get it going. Particularly around here, as I said, because this is where they're prone to cracking. Right. That'll do for a minute. So we shall come back in 15 minutes or so. Where no doubt I'll be proven a liar and it'll have done absolutely nothing. But we shall see. Normally it works. When I stripped the forks off, I forgot to mention this at the time, I discovered a sticker on the headstock which uh, says Ace Cycle World, Chicago's largest dealer. So I don't know whether they are the people that sold this bike originally or what. I'm going to have to do some research, see who these people are. They might even still exist. Um, so I'll have to look it up online and when I find out, I'll let you know. Right, it's had uh, about 20 minutes or so. It hasn't bubbled up as much as normal. 
So it looks like it is going to make me look like a liar, but we shall see when we start scraping. So, oh no, there we go. It hasn't bubbled as much as I expected, but. Not exactly hard work to get down to bare metal, was it? A few simple scrapes. So I'm just going to continue now, work my way around the frame doing all of that. Well, no I'm not, that's a complete lie. I'm going to strip it off around where I said there could be damage. And I'll bring you back once it's all back stripped around here. So give us a minute and we'll see what it looks like with the paint off. Okay, quick scrape and a wire brush. And I'm glad to say the paint stripper has worked exactly as I expected to. As you can see, we're down to very nearly bare metal on the first attempt. Uh, in fact, so much so that some minor abrasive work now could probably get that sorted out. I will give it another coat. But whilst we're in the area, the part I was most concerned about is where this tube meets the here. There's a weld around there, cracks there. Uh, it's absolutely perfect. And it can also crack up here where the mounting point is for the uh, swinging arm. And that too is absolutely perfect. So I'm going to give it another coat. Oh, let me just, let me just show you a little bit higher up. Just so you know. Take you up slowly. As you can see, I, you know, I think that is for the first application of paint stripper. I think that's absolutely superb. Uh, the smaller areas around the brain, the bracketry, some of the smaller tubes obviously take more work. Um, but that's what I'm going to do now. So another down, another dose of paint stripper, another half an hour and a bit more work with a wire brush and I think that's it then. It will be pretty much done and then I'll just go over it with some uh, abrasive paper then to get rid of the last of the uh, last of the paint. So you might as well just come back and see it when it's done because I'm merely going to keep repeating now the process that we have been through already. When I was stripping the uh, frame down, getting the end of that I should say, not stripping the frame down, I mentioned that there was uh, two oil plates, one on the engine, one on the frame, and whilst we got the frame upside down, getting the paint off it, I thought I'd just show you the, uh, the bottom of the frame, there's a, a filter that fitted in here, you saw that earlier, plate, two gaskets, the studs have come out of this one, doesn't really matter, it's not a big deal. Uh, and that's where the second oil filter screen is on these. Um, so I just thought I'd mention it whilst I had it upside down. While the frame's flipped over, I just thought I'd show you the second application. This is the second coat of the paint stripper. Uh, As you can see, hopefully, very neatly gets rid of the remnants from the first application. See that, but there's very little abrasive work needed now to get rid of the remnants. So, although it's slightly long winded, I would imagine this whole frame will have taken me a couple of hours by the end. It's boring but relatively painless. So, there we go, well on the way.
All right, after the second coat paint stripper, the small amount of stuff that's left, I've used a, I used a wire brush on an angle grinder just to get rid of it. There's going to be small places that you can't get into. They can be finished off by hand. Or yet more paint stripper can be flooded into these areas to encourage the last bits out. Or something like a Dremel, if you wanted to get into every last tiny nook and cranny, a Dremel would get in, clean all those up. The benefit of finishing off with something like this is it leaves the surface ideally lightly scratched for the uh, edge primer to really uh, dig into. So it's an ideal finishing tool. So I'm just going to go over the whole frame now with this. Finish off any minor bits and then I'll panel wipe it. And it'll be getting some edge primer which we shall see shortly. Right, the uh, frame is stripped. And I don't know if you can see that clearly, but it is now suspended by a rope across the garage, which will enable me to get to all parts of it with the spray gun. So the first thing to do is just put a couple of coats of etch on, which will protect it against rusting. And then after that, before I put the primer on, because etch is really very thin, I will then go around and make doubly sure that everything that needs to be bunged up is bunged up and all the threads are covered up that need to be covered up. But a coat of etch on them won't do them any harm at all. Uh, so that's the next step. Mix up some etch and paint it. Although I'm afraid you're not going to see any of that because the camera is far too valuable to be exposing it to uh, clouds and clouds of etch primer. So the next time you see it, it will be etched. The frame's in etch, which means I can handle it a lot more easily now as well. The darker grey sections you can see at the minute are where there were still minor bits of uh, paint stuck from the stripping process in gaps which I hadn't spotted before I etched it. Um, so they were scraped out and in, an aerosol etch was used which is U-Pol which I've used many times. You can get U-Pol, I think it's acid 8 and you can also get a darker U-Pol which is what's on there and they're both extremely good in fact, the frame could easily have been done in aerosol, had I wished. Uh, a couple of cans would have done it, I'm sure. But anyway, so the next step is I will re-plug all my various orifices with new tape. Because although I didn't mind the odd bit of etch getting near them, because it's very, very, very thin, I certainly don't want a high bill primer anywhere near it. I will be putting a dark grey primer on, which is actually light grey primer with uh, a bit of black base added, which you're not really meant to do, but it should be okay, normally works. Because I now have the Dove Grey matched to the RAL number, it looks really good. It looks like a really good match. And with my eyesight, I can't put a light grey base coat on top of a light grey primer because I'll never see where the one begins and the other ends. So I'll be going for a darker grey primer so that the dove grey going on top, it'll take more paint, but at least I'll stand a fighting chance of seeing bits I have missed. So when you come back again, this will hopefully all be in a darker high bill grey. Again, I can't show you the paint process. I will do it step by step when I do the tank just to show you how I do it, um, which will be in a later video. Whether that will be of any use to you in your circumstances, I don't know. It's just how I do it, and that's what I'll be showing. So the next time you see it, it should hopefully all be dark grey.
Right, we're in. Uh, let's drop down a little bit. We're in the darker grey now of the primer. It's had a few. No, not a few. It's had a quick rub down. You might spot some lighter parts on the frame, making making it look slightly more dappled. Um, that's just where I've given it a rub down. Got rid of minor imperfections. There are a couple of spots where there are tiny, oh, I don't know what you call them, small chips, I suppose, in the steel from road damage. But that's, you know, I could stop them all up if I was going for a show bike, but they are tiny, so I'm really not that bothered. There's bits of weld spatter from the original welding that's got on the frame. I could grind all that off and stop it up. Again, I'm not really that bothered. Um, it's just got to look presentable and it's smooth enough now to look okay I think time will tell so the next step is to put it in dove grey which I will show you in one second right this is what the paint shops come up with for dove grey and it looks remarkably good I'm very happy with that looks very much like the colours I've seen so that's what we're going to put on as a base coat the reason I'm using a base coat is I have a couple of stickers that need to go on the frame as well. So I'll base it up, put the stickers on, which I'll show you, and then lacquer the whole lot to give the final finish. And there we are. A couple of coats of uh, Dove Grey base coat. Looks pretty good. Any minor imperfections can be uh, touched in at a later date reasonably easily. So once that's fully flashed off, which uh, it hasn't yet, we can uh, put the stickers on and lacquer it. But I'm quite happy with that so far. I like the colour. I'm glad I didn't do it in black. I know it wasn't a colour that everyone liked at the time, certainly not the US market, but uh, I think it's different and I like it. And that's all that matters really. Right, the frame is now in lacquer. Hopefully you'll see that it looks a bit shinier than when it's in its base coat. I'm hoping you can, I'm quite happy with it, it's turned out pretty well. Given it's been done in a domestic garage, I'm more than happy with it. In fact, it's uh, nice and even and shiny, which is what you want. I've applied the uh, transfers. I didn't know whether I was going to get water slides or vinyl. They turned out to be vinyl, which is why I haven't bothered showing you their application. Because basically, you just peel back the backing paper line it up the way you want it, stick it down, flatten it off very carefully and then apply your chosen lacquer over the top. I'll discuss lacquers and things when we come to the patron tank as I've mentioned before. So for the minute just accept the fact it's been lacquered. I really like uh, stuff like this. Uh, it's, a, it's only a small detail, I, I know that. Uh, and in relation to the whole restoration process, it's a frippery really. But I think these little stickers, which have been reproduced now for lots and lots of classic bikes, really make the difference to rebuild. Uh, even simple things like under seat warning stickers and battery warning stickers and Lucas coil stickers. It, it really brings the bike alive, I think. So we're, we're very lucky to have access to stuff like this, I think. Anyway, that's neither here nor there, really. So that's the frame done. I will paint the swinging arm and various other bits that bolt onto it separately. So the next time you see the frame will be when we will start to reassemble it in a, another video. So this video is fairly short. Now when I finish waffling on, immediately after this clip, there's a, a short section showing a photograph which was a postcard from Ace 
cycle world in Chicago. Uh, I think the picture's probably late 60s looking at it, which if you recall from earlier in this video, was the dealer sticker I found on the headstock. And it turns out that uh, Ace Cycles were a very large dealership, very popular dealership, run by a very uh, enterprising entrepreneur whose name temporarily escapes me, which is why I wrote it down, uh, a man called Basil Proskin, who from very small beginnings turned it into one of the largest dealerships in the USA handling BSA Norton. He also did Motoguzzi and Ducati and then eventually Japanese bikes as they took over the market. Um, he was a very forward-looking man. He provided a profits-linked pension system for his employees. He gave them the month of January off. Uh, he seemed like a really guy, a really... Well, what's the word I'm looking for? A guy before his time, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, and as a result, his dealership was very big, very busy. So busy that, uh, according to one source, they could sell up to 100 motorbikes on a good Saturday. Now, that's a phenomenal volume, unbelievable volume. Uh, and with volumes like that, it's little wonder the British bike companies were so keen on the American market. Uh, phenomenal stuff. So, after this waffle that I'm giving you at the minute, the video will end with a short clip of the postcard stroke photo which I found on the internet showing Cycle World in what I think is probably the late 60s looking at the bikes outside, it's hard to tell, uh, when they were dealing with British bikes and uh, Ducati. But they also handled Moto Guzzi at some time. Um, so it's an interesting photo. I was delighted to find it. Uh, it's the history of these things which is, really makes rebuilding stuff like this even more interesting for me. And as a result, I'm extremely grateful to Chuckman Chicago Nostalgia, who found the uh, postcard, scanned it, put it up, and uh, got six comments from other people saying that they remember the bike shop, they remember going to it in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, because without people like that putting this sort of historical stuff on the web, I would have never known any more about that little sticker that was on my headstock and where this Firebird probably started its life in the USA. So, wonderful stuff. So the picture's coming up right now. <laughs>